Intensively farmed meat is bad for everybody involved, but proper dry aged artisan meat, that's a thing of beauty. And I'm on a mission to learn all about it. So I'm gonna go and see the Beef Baron of London, Richard Turner. He's worked with some of the most important chefs in the world, Marco Pierre White, Pierre Kaufman, and the Rue Brothers. Not only is he responsible for some of the most important beef restaurants that have happened in London over the last eight to nine years, including Pit Q and Hawksmoor, He's also the guy that brought the groundbreaking Meatopia Festival that happens every year that attracts chefs from all over the world. If there's one guy that can tell me about beef and that's happened here in the UK over the last eight years, Richard Turner's the guy. I was reading that you were um, you were a para and you came out of the army and you were doing close protection. Close okay. protection. And so you used to go to all these top restaurants. And that's where was it the was it Le Gavroche? Le Gavroche, yeah. So Rue Brothers. Yeah. I was eating in there sort of quite a lot. Every single day. They eventually they, they, they gave me a job. I left there, I went to uh, Harvey's. With Marco Pierre White. Marco Pierre White. Uh, then I went to Kaufman's. Uh, to Tonclair, and then afterwards I went back to Marco at uh, the restaurant Marco Pierre White. The Gavroche was pretty tough, uh, it was not dissimilar to the Paras, <laughs> Long, longer hours. I mean, uh, you know, they're all tough kitchens. You know? Yeah. And I was planning a steakhouse for some years, uh, and I went to eat at Hawksmoor and found that they'd already done what I was planning. And I asked them if I could throw my lot in with them. That was 10 years ago. I remember when Hawksmoor opened, it definitely we kind of went, we're doing, we're stepping up a gear here, you know. Well, stepping back a gear, I thought. Okay. I mean, we were taking it, we, we were focusing on flavour, focusing on simplicity, focusing on, on ingredients. There's no clever tricks. So at a time when people were going for Michelin stars and uh, yes. there were foams around and jellies yes. and, and all this stuff going on, and we just took it right back to basics. Basically, most of the work starts right at the beginning. And yeah. then it's, you know, from the animal to how it's kept, what it's fed, the breed, and then onwards through to the butcher, how it's treated, how it's hung. There's a guy in, in Northern Ireland, Peter Hannon, who is a master of aging, one of the best in, in the world, I think. And he's, he's aging some immense beef. And then when it gets in your kitchen, all the work's done for you. Yes. All you have to do is add salt yeah. and fire. <laughs> and who doesn't want to do that? So what are we cooking? Okay, we're cooking a porterhouse steak here. Um, it's about 30 months old, I think. Uh, the animal is 30 months old. This is only been aged for five weeks on the bone. Okay. Uh, it's just salt. We don't use anything else. We used to use a little pepper, but we stopped doing that about two years ago. Why the porterhouse? Well, the porterhouse has two muscles. You've got uh, the fillet here. You've got the sirloin there. My favorite changes depending on my mood, but uh, you know, if, I, if I'm really hungry, something that's this size, 900 grams, is, uh, is pretty, pretty good. Pretty it's only been out for like 10 minutes maximum. So it's not ice cold when it goes, or, or fridge cold when it goes on the grill. It's because it, it'll get too dark on the outside and the inside will be too cold still. So you just want to get, just start to come up to room temperature. But I cook a lot slower. My grill's not quite as hot as some people's grills. We, we let it burn down so it's white. A good handful of salt all over it. Wow. Lots of salt on there, most of it's going to fall off on the grill. Okay. So if you don't do that, you're under seasoning. Okay, because people would look at that and go, bloody hell, that's a lot of salt. Yeah, if you're cooking on a plancher or in a pan, then obviously that is an awful lot of salt. Okay. But because you've got grills, it falls through. It's all falling through. First, but I'm going to bang the salt off first okay. on, on there. We turn it 20 times, 30 times. Really? We keep turning to get maximum Maillard or caramelization on the outside of the steak. We don't want bars. If you look on those pictures that you yes. see outside cheap steakhouses, yes. they've, got, just... yeah, they've got bars. We don't do bars. It's just silliness. It's silliness. <laughs> Nurturing the steak, looking after it, and then it'll go in, into like a resting area down there. The leaner the cut, the rarer you'd eat it. So the more fat, the more close to medium you'd have it. I mean, People eat medium well, that's fine by me. Okay. But, but you want a fatty cut for medium well. 
I, I, I'm not a fan of rare in any cut. Yeah. I don't think it presents well. So for me, medium rare, medium, medium well. Rare is for people that are showing off, I think. Well done is probably the same as rare to me. I mean, you know, it's, it's not. Yeah. It's not a great way to, to show steak. Yes. Yes. But, you know, the customer's always right. <laughs> I shall lift onto the tray and put it on top to keep warm. Breakfast. <laughs> it actually is breakfast. I know. So that is a 900 gram porterhouse steak, fillet on the left, sirloin on the right. Most importantly, it's been rested for 20 minutes. <laughs> like it's nine o'clock in the morning. When a piece of beef has been reared properly, slaughtered properly, and then aged properly, what you're getting is a really subtle beef flavour. Because beef's not the most robust of flavours, really. I guess the key things to point out are the way they cook it develops this even crust on the outside. It's not cold and too pink on the, on the middle when you ask for medium rare because they take it out for 10 minutes and bring it up to room temperature. The moving around all the time means that you get an even gnarly crust. And because they don't mess around with it, they just put top quality sea salt on there. What you're tasting is pedigree beef. Every component, every detail of the steak from field to plate is analyzed, looked at, respected, taken back to the old school, and then just delivered. It was incredible. It's, and I can see what was de delivered in the way that you cooked it with the sort of crust that you developed on the outside, like it's spectacular. Obviously you've got to put your hand in Belfast, who's the, the steak guru for the Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers, buddy. Good man. Thank Good you. Respect. How totally awesome was that? Like, I just got schooled by the, the Jedi Knight of Beef. <laughs> Richard Turner. Going back to the old school, bringing all those old techniques, but paying so much attention to every detail. Next up I need to find out about this Peter Hannon dude. He's the butcher from Northern Ireland that's started to age beef 200, 300, 400 days old. Come on, let's go find out about him. Okay, so this Peter Hannon dude He's a legend. He's like a rock star butcher. He has learned how to age beef past 28 days without it having that funky blue cheese taste. And it's because he developed a Himalayan salt chamber specifically for it. That is cool, man. Peter. Yeah, uh, I sent you an email. Yes, John, yeah, yeah. So Tuesday. We're off to Ireland. We're going on a little adventure to Northern Ireland.